Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was fun. This was so hard, says Edda. Very nice. Well, yes. Cool. Uh, so maybe Limonas, you can share later with us this uh, the you know web address so we can practice uh, every morning. Yeah, but not now. I think because we can lose some people as they can move on into the uh, excelling at fing finger movement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Change the career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Okay. Shall we start first, maybe a bit uh, um, who we are and then why we're here? Even though we yeah. we see some, I see some familiar faces, and they might recognize us too. Or rather, the names we see. <laughs> yeah, or other names. Um, you want to start, Snezna? Yeah, I can start. Um, so. Um, yeah, as I said, we met two days ago. Although I'm not sure I met all of the people. Um, and uh, Lyman said, why are we here? I think there are a couple of reasons why we are here. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, we are part of the Hub Council, so somehow the, the original group that was thinking about this, uh, this course. And secondly, maybe because uh, there is some, some experience and the background of, uh, for both of us, but Lyman can, of course, speak for, for himself in online learning, yeah? And blended in MOOCs and so on. And then also because basically when we were looking at the program uh, for this uh, for this online course, we said, okay, these are the topics that interest us. Yeah. So it's not something that uh, maybe we would uh, uh, before offer sessions, although I think both of us have experiences also uh, kind of training online learning, but it's more that it's something that kind of resonates with us. So we did also a little bit of research in the past days and so on. So we thought also to share with you somehow our, um, our experience is in our view. Um, if you remember this morning, Tomek and Michelle were talking about the rest of the day. So basically the first kind of session that we have is about quality aspects of non-formal education and how they translate online. So it's not um, a session or an input on what are the quality aspects also because we saw that in the HOP uh, course you already kind of, you yourself named some of the things that you would like to see. But it's more really see, not questioning them. So it's not the time to say, oh, is this really a quality aspect or not? But it's really how do we do this online and and what are some of the lessons learned uh, from us yeah but more on that later maybe Lyman as you can also say a few words about yourself since you're so well yeah. prepared <laughs> <laughs> well uh, yeah when I saw the topic of uh, like um, perspectives on the online learning sort of from the youth work field from the informal learning field I actually had uh, mm -hmm. some reflections on that when I started uh, uh, implementing online courses in the youth work field. Um, so I think so far I had uh, now what four, four or five um, uh, massive open online courses, meaning that my experience is mainly coming from uh, managing uh, courses with participants of um, 700 people, 1,000, sometimes 1,500, and so on. Um, and these are uh, probably you know different experiences than you have uh, 20 people or a very intensive experience or uh, online and then residential so I think the, the things that I will be sharing here would be mainly from so-called MOOCs uh, and a few of them you might have heard there's one on um, Erasmus plus funding opportunities for youth youth policy um, European solidarity core um, then one that we are now still working on is on European citizenship. So a uh, few few courses here and there. Uh, one on HOP actually, a uh, few on um, Canvas Network. So, and I think Snash, you will be more uh, also talking from your experience on uh, having blended courses, so combining online and then residential and working with some smaller groups as well. Indeed. Yes, we are actually in together with this MOOC that is on HOP, uh, but my experience indeed is more connected to the blended learning experiences. So, so yeah. Very good. So shall we ask the first questions that we have? and see kind of slide into our topics uh, just to really remind me that this is a discussion mode 
so you can really ask questions so you don't need to uh, type into the chat box unless you have a device that doesn't allow you to speak or whatever but we are really looking forward to having a dialogue uh, in this sense uh, so what we have you uh, with you is um, we have as we said we should be sharing our perspectives but we would also like to kind of some, have some little surveys and also use the Jamboard, which is the recent discovery that all of us have since uh, whatever it was Wednesday. Um, but the first thing that we would like to ask you is uh, what kind of uh, learner are you online? There are three options. Uh, so you can tell us a little bit about who you are. Uh, similar questions were asked on the, on the HOP uh, course online, but we kind of made them a little bit uh, shorter just to see a summary. Okay, we have 68% of people voted. It's very precise, 79. <laughs> All right, I think we can, uh, for now we have 80% uh, but since we are not voting ourselves, so maybe we can show it. So I think I do this and then, yeah, so can you see the results? Yeah, I can see the results. Well, okay, also Ada says yes. Very good, so it would appear that we have uh, quite a few people that would rather observe what others have to say than those who are willing to interact with others and then those who would prefer to learn alone. Um, I suppose this is why we are struggling a little bit with the discussion mode, so invite those who would rather observe, that's also fine, but if you're still willing to interact, uh, that's that's also great. Aha, so some attendees are double. Okay, I mean, we are not doing this for the research purposes, although that's a really good point, but uh, it's just really a quick overview in a way to see, yeah? Um, so this is really, we asked just as a, as a kind of quick warm up and we will pick up on this, um, this particular thing of, you know, how do you behave as a learner or how the learners in general behave, how much they participate, how much they want to stand back on uh, later with some of the other uh, quality principles, but it was really good to have this overview. Yeah, uh, and I think that, that's very much reflects the reality in the online yeah. courses. When we started asking actually what role people want to take, uh, they would be really diverse and I would even say uh, we had surprising results that quite a number of people online, they prefer to observe or rather, you know, uh, learn alone, which sometimes gives answers why we sometimes feel that, oh, people are not so much participating in discussions, for example, but we're going to get mm. to, to this later. Yeah, we get to that, yeah. Very good. So I close this and then we asked you to, the, uh, to come to the Jamboard uh, because it's so cool. Uh, so here is the link. In the chat. In the mm -hmm. chat, yeah. Uh, and our question here is, um, although it might sound a little bit like a kind of beginner question, but in general, uh, the question is what kind of content from your youth work field um, or, you know, non-formal education in general, would you put online? Yeah, What are your intentions uh, in general? Yeah, Maybe a little bit also there's a background to this, que this question. Uh, Lyman and I are also involved into putting Yokomo online, which I mentioned a couple of days ago. And there we have three different types uh, of courses. And one is general, the other one is attitudes, behaviors. And for example, when we were about to put attitudes and behaviors, we were also wondering how much can we actually go with these, uh, some of these kind of deep explorations and topics online, yeah? So this is the question here, yeah? So you can just click on the sticky note, which is on the on your left-hand side, and then you can add uh, a note and say, yeah, what kind of content would you personally like uh, to use online learning for? Imanes, do you think you can share your screen? Do you have the double monitor so we see what's going on with the Jamboard or? Shall I? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me see. We said that we're going to learn this tool also after actually doing it. Exactly. <laughs> and here it goes. 
we have a first uh, yeah first contribution that says if coronavirus is here to say then everything yeah which is potentially a good point huh? but i think through this course we will also like, explore a little bit like if everything is really there to be put online or not we see mm -hmm. what do others say what are your contributions to this what imagine you have you're working with different kind of content i see trainers i have i see people from different organizations so out of this which part would you say oh actually that makes sense to put online well certain things maybe you would say it wouldn't fit in terms of dynamic or or you know objectives so what kind of topics or what kind of things you would you would rather put online As you can see um, in Jamboard, everyone can play uh, with a, so we have a little bit of someone trying to enlarge, someone trying to squeeze it in and so on. But so we have also volunteer support, support for volunteers. So that seems to be quite a popular one. Wait, this one was just. Okay, so these are kind of together. So maybe more, so support for young people, volunteers, workers, self-care, mindfulness check-ins to be quite predominant videos documenting participants work that's what i did so far introduction to trainings to get participants on the same page before meeting in person so this is more going in the blended direction what is this i need to enlarge this the project implementation basic elements non form education introduction Supporting re personal reflection of volunteers. Active content, more interaction, reflection, fun, empowerment, stimulate curiosity, curiosity, empower, autonomous, autonomous learning. So we'll just move one, this one here. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> content where participants need to follow their own pace. Uh, that's cool. Uh, this is something that we will also be tackling in a way. Uh, what kind of options do we have? Uh, whose pace do we follow? Um, so on. Fun interactive activities to make learning online fun, like finger exercise. I think we can leave Lyman as you put a finger exercise and that's it. That's the, that's the bar. Okay, is it something that I missed? Uh -huh. Last we did a training course for method training, train our volunteers to train professionals on how to use our methods, reflections, also kind of multiplying, nothing too personal. It's also quite a good point. Um, I suppose this comes also with the GDPR, but not only. Yeah, one thing is personal, the other thing is really going into motions. Cool. I think we have a I think quite a good overview to start with. Um, and of course, if you want to add something else, the Jamboard is there. We will then put it uh, later on on, uh, on the page. Um, this is another kind of a warm up question just to see uh, wh where your interest lies and also to relate a little bit our experience maybe to what you just uh, just said, um, because we do have, I mean, we and just to say, we don't have all the experience in the world. So surely there will be some of the things that you would put online that we didn't try out yet, but still maybe we can in our examples relate it to, um, to what you were saying here yeah super cool so, and so, sharing now yeah yeah and sharing uh and then i think uh, with these kind of ideas also that we now have or initial information i think we can start with um, uh, with the things that we have planned and once again strong invitation to use the discussion mode just uh, you know tell us what concretely you want to know in in each of these uh, segments but what our plan was today for this uh, one hour and now it's uh, it's a bit less is to really take some of the main principles of, of quality of non-formal education and try to elaborate our experience to relate it to each of them uh, in the in the online learning environments yeah so there and not only if you have questions but actually because as Lyman was saying we see here people that are colleagues and we know that they are doing also online work and so on jump in and say well in my experience it was like this yeah 
and that's that's even better. Very cool. So, Lyman, as you want to continue? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, I think uh, distincts non-formal learning from other fields of learning that it's something that people take it on their free will. And um, after I think after starting an first online course, I understood that it actually um, it's very close to this principle of, of voluntary learning because uh, in a way, the course is out there. Anyone can join it. Anyone can participate on this. Um, uh, usually the courses we put online in this field are for free. So it's really easy to, to get access. Um, and I felt that, you know, the principle of, of voluntary learning is especially vivid in the online learning environment because people come there, there are not too many restrictions in a way, you know, they can decide when to come, uh, when to join this course. So in terms of having this principle online, I feel it's quite, um, it's a good environment to, to provide space for this principle that really people, if they want to join it, they can do it. Yeah, because sometimes we say, okay, there is a informal learning opportunity there, but it's not always accessible because of many reasons. And we're going to talk about this more um, uh, about when we touch the next principle of, of inclusiveness. So, but I feel, you know, like that the online learning really gives a lot of chance for people to join the course on a free will. Yeah. And in, in this case, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's a good opportunity, really. It, it, we uh, lower the barriers a lot if we, if we compare it to some of residential courses where people need to, they want to go there, but there are barriers, or they need to be selected and so on. Mm -hmm. I would try and uh, to check um, the yep. question. What do you feel? Shall yeah? I or do you want to do it? Okay. Let me see. Okay. So here's the question that you should see in your experience of online learning. Yeah, so think only of online learning. Was it fully voluntary or maybe somebody told you have to do it actually? Um, or it was actually the, the criteria to move on into something? Mm -hmm. I remember once I had to take online learning about the security measures when I applied for the contract for the UN. So I have to learn how to recognize mines in the field or... Did, uh, did you learn something about viruses? So. No, but I learned a few things how to behave safely in some kind of hot areas of the world. And cool. So that was, I had to even pass two levels because I was going to a very dangerous country. <laughs> So, results coming in. I think we have most of people who voted already. In the absence of uh, Europe, uh, European Song Contest, the Eurovision, we can, uh, we can do this. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, one third said it was kind of voluntary. Um, uh, one quarter said actually it wasn't voluntary because that was probably a requirement and then 20% uh, said it, yeah it was like completely completely voluntary experience I think maybe to add uh, if that's okay from the blended also learning perspective this is something that we were talking the other day um, actually this voluntary I think it's stretched a little bit in this in this environment and I will be curious to know from people who implement it yeah, uh, Lymanus, can you show the results? Because I cannot, I think, because you published. So if you stop voting and then show the results, so. Okay, yeah, sharing. Yeah, there we go. 
Yeah, so it's interesting to see. I think this this kind of results uh, reflect a little bit of my experience also. Yeah, because uh, in the blended learning, um, you know, very often people would sign up for um, Joanna says the requirement in the university. Yeah, um, in the blended, it's usually a requirement to actually take the whole package. Yeah, so if you want to participate in a in a cool course that you want, then nowadays it's like yeah, okay, it's an online phase. There is a residential, so people sign up for everything. Yes, it's voluntary, but at the same time, it's kind of uh, something that they have to do to go through. So I think what we try to do in the blended courses to 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 kind of enforce this voluntary character is that. We would strongly motivate people to participate and do the things and do the tasks, but it's really, it's not obligatory. So we never ever implemented this uh, principle of, you know, if you don't participate in whatever, uh, 80% you don't come, which I know, for example, when I was participating in the Tothre of the Council of Europe, really, if you don't do, I don't know, uh, I don't remember what was it, maybe 70%, then you don't come to the residential. Yeah? So I think in that case, it's definitely not uh, not your choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for me, it's, uh, may I? Uh, yes, please. Uh, blended, I, I, would, uh, I would underline this uh, because, um, but for me, the question is if you have small numbers, then you have a lot of uh, dropout and we're coming to this idea of learners engagement. So you have an online phase, which you planned, which you laid out. And in your course, you have 20 people and they took the whole package because it's a fancy residential course, but the exactly. online phase is uh, they don't like. And then you have popping up, uh, I don't know, four or five people if you're happy. Um, and uh, this raises a lot of questions. I mean, if you have a, a big course with, I don't know, 100 students, uh, then you, you have a lot of dropout. And with the with the 15 people who are there, you make something. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. But if you work with small numbers, yeah, you have 15, 20 people in a course, and then you have a high dropout. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. No, if, I don't have recommendation for this, but it's just a question um, how to deal with this. Um, just, to, just to keep it in mind, yeah. I think it's also, uh, I mean, how do we deal it in the residential? I'm sure all of us had these situations where you have people that come, but are maybe even physically there, but not in spirit or... You know, so I think it's it's just another example how this online, non-formal, if you would like, very often mimics what happens in the residentials as well. Yeah, and it's the same dilemma. Yeah, what do you do? You do, do you force people, and then it's really not voluntary, but then you kind of call on their responsibility and so on. So it's true. I mean, we don't have uh, answers, but I think for me, and this is a very personal perspective, I think it's important to leave it voluntary. Otherwise, forcing people to complete something just goes against a little bit of. Um, I don't know, of the quality principles, I would say. But uh, maybe someone else would like to contribute to this particular aspect. I can share an experience. Marcus? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. Hey, Marcus. <laughs> hey, Sneche Lemons. We had also this blended package for the Tosca, the first Tosca training course we did. And uh, we also did not make it obligatory and worked with motivation and very often reminders and support. So reminders in the form of support offers. We see you did not complete this exercise. Can we support you in anything? Um, because and some issues we faced, it was mentioned already, is that you cannot make it obligatory also because there will also be last minute dropouts. Then you have people who just sign up for the course in the last three days because somebody dropped out. And you need to be able to also integrate these, oh, yes. of course. That was one thing we found. Another challenge we found is that we really tried our best to take elements from the online course and use them in the residential course so that it's not two separated things, but they really flow into each other. Group division mm. would have made already during the online course were kept, for instance, during the residential course. These were very nice things. Um, results that have been produced during the online course were made reference to during the residential course and built up on. But there's limitations. For instance, mm. we wanted everybody to make an organizational assessment on solidarity. But of course, what to do with people who didn't do it? So then, in the mm. of course, you need to give some space for those who didn't do it to catch up if you want to build up on such results. Mm. And I remember it, it went very well overall. But one feedback I remember from the overall course reflection was one girl saying, hey, actually, I could have joined without putting so much effort into the online course. So some mm. people also felt like, yeah, you motivated us so much, but actually we see some of our colleagues did not put so much effort and it was also okay for them. So there is this issue a bit. 
Also with the level of knowledge. You mm. provide a lot of knowledge before because you want, to come, want people to come with a certain level of knowledge, mm. but you still need to be able to provide the basics during the residential course to balance out the inequality you might have in the group. Mm. So there's limitations, yep. yes. But I agree, you cannot make it obligatory, but rather work with supportive reminders and motivation. Yeah, yeah. You know, kind invitations. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like invitation to the plenary after the coffee break. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, I think we have a lot of things that come and, and kind of, yeah, everything is interlinked, so we can move on to the next one. But actually, maybe this one, we start immediately with a, with a survey. Uh, thank you for your participation in the survey. And here comes another one. Um, so this is more of a statement uh, to ask, do you feel that online learning is generally more inclusive than other types of learning? Yeah. And then you have options that you totally agree, partially agree, partially disagree, or totally disagree. Yeah. Maybe in your experience, or if you don't have so much experience, then I don't know, uh, your, um, how do you see it envisaged and so on. Okay, 53%, 68%. I want more options, says Edda. Well, life is tough, Edda, <laughs> what to do? <laughs> but you can, we will be very happy to hear from you because this is what we would like to see. Eh? So when people vote is that maybe you, you share why you feel this way and then you can explain why you would want another option. I think last time we also uh, stayed at six, uh, 16 people voting. So I think we can do the same. We end the voting and we share results. Yeah, can you see them? Yeah. Yeah. So no one totally agrees. Um, there is quite a strong partially agree, uh, partially disagree, and then some people saying totally disagree. I yeah, interesting. Uh, would someone want to say why they partially, partially, or yeah, totally disagree? You'll be very happy to hear your voices. Uh, I oh sorry, there are many people. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hi, Ada. Can I go? Yeah, Sorry yeah, about yeah. this. Maybe that was a better way of doing that. Um, the reason why I said uh, I want more options is because I was torn between partially agree and partially disagree. So it's neither agree nor disagree. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a question of what is the potential and how online learning or what is there could be improved in terms of its inclusiveness. Um, yes, it can reach many, uh, much more people, uh, but the tools that are available um, or that we are mostly making use of right now is not always accessible for uh, different people. I think the most obvious is uh, people with uh, different sensorial disabilities. But I think it's not only that, it's also a question of uh, having access to still uh, resources, online resources as well, and also being literate about online resources. Um, so it was my, but uh, I put it in partially disagree, but I could have also said partially agree, because I also see it uh, inclusive that more people can participate uh, it's economically more uh, financially more inclusive and it can reach more people also for time wise thank you Ada. hi hi hello so we have Dagna and Trisha I think one yeah shall I go yes Trisha goes and then Dagna thank you <laughs> um, I just, it was I was to agree with Ada as she said the reason I'm thinking, yeah, it's um, inclusive in terms of it certainly opens up to a lot more people who can't travel, but also it's less inclusive, if you like to say that, in terms of maybe people don't have the resources, don't have the Wi-Fi, don't have the technology. So, yeah, so I partially disagreed on that. So, really, it's very much what Ada had said. Mm -hmm. And nice to see you both. Thank you. Okay, we have Dagna and Sami, maybe to hear, and then... Uh... Um, okay, so that short comment, I totally disagree, because to me, yeah. uh, inclusive um, environment, learning environment, is has to be inclusive, and we can make also online environment, which is not inclusive. So to me, just, I would not say that owner 
online learning is more inclusive than the other types of learning because in every place we need to try to make it as inclusive as, as possible that's it okay so the uh, environment per se is not inclusive or not but it's what we do with it yeah yeah i think okay okay so how do we bring sami back ah here yeah, i'm back <laughs> uh for me i am thinking about more about the devices and other things that uh most of the people, at least in Finland and in Europe, uh, they have the devices, but it's like more how they know use the the online platforms and that sort of things. So it's more like an educational thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more about the skills to skills mm -hmm. to use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lyman, as you had quite a good, uh, few good points also in relation to MOOCs, for example, and the inclusivity, maybe you would like to share with, um, with, uh, with the people. Yeah, so a few things I already mentioned, I think, that uh, when it comes to uh, MOOCs where people kind of freely choose whether to participate or not, this is something we always try to promote and tell also to national agencies saying, look, promote this course to anyone because there is no limit we can accommodate thousands of people so i think in that case you know there is no application to fill in there is no selection then really so in that sense i felt running a mooc uh, i'm really not adding any kind of barriers and i remember also when building courses we would start discussions what is our target group my answer would be often well it's anyone who is interested in the content that's it yeah of course we have some typical learners in mind but at the same time we don't really put any barrier so people don't need to travel it was mentioned already people don't need to pay for it at least for the courses we did so far in the youth work field um and there are also a few other things like for example people don't have to talk in front of the group People will be very good in the language of the course. If it's English, if people don't feel very confident about it, and sometimes you see from the discussions that people maybe are not very good in English, but I can see it very often people use Google Translate and their contribution in discussion or their assignment was done by using some translation tools. And in these moments, I feel, wow, this is really great. I mean, we see this happening in residential activities more and more, but then the online really gives that time of reading several times or watching the video several times, uh, even taking the transcript, because usually uh, we add transcript of the video under the video, so actually you can download this all, translate, and then you know see what's the content. Uh, we are promoting very often that videos can be translated by anyone who wants. And that's how we got for Erasmus Plus MOOC. We had plenty of materials translated by people to other languages. So then the material actually becomes more and more accessible. Um, and I think that's why it's quite um, important that um, uh, People who are developing content, we would always think of these uh, of these needs. So, if somebody wants to translate something, let's add transcripts under the videos. Yeah. Uh, in general, when I worked with uh, Canvas Network, it's quite strict rules. You have to have transcripts. You have to have them downloadable. Uh, people who cannot hear, they can read. Uh, People who cannot see, they can have a text-to-speech function. So there are many technological solutions that allow people also with certain uh, challenges still to actually go through the content. So in that case, I felt that, uh, you know, finally, when I was transferring certain content from residential seminars to online, I felt this content now is really much more accessible than I had before. Um, I think maybe just to add one more thing, and then there is also a very good comment from Christine. But you, or so I don't have to read. I think all of it. Uh, but in 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 general, it's that she feels that we did a lot with uh, making residential courses inclusive, but it's not necessarily the case with uh, with the online. And I think I partly agree and partly disagree. And I think uh, one thing is that I also what I notice in blended courses and when compare uh, with uh, yeah, so with online part with residential is that. 
online usually has, even if it's not self-paced, so the pace comes from the facilitator, it is slower in pace. Yeah. So for people who need more time, so it's not like, you know, go to your groups, you have 20 minutes, come back to the plenary kind of thing, but it's that people really can take their time to do certain tasks. I think that also uh, enables uh, enables things to happen. I mean, just to say, it's not, of course, uh, we need to acknowledge the digital competences, accessibility of the devices and so on and so forth. But I feel the inclusivity is becoming a topic more and more in the online context. And we are trying, of course, that doesn't mean if a person doesn't have a device or if they are really not kind of skilled in using it, that that's uh, so easy. But I think another thing that we, we do is with these orientations. And I think we did it for the MOOC, we did it for the blended courses, yeah, that you allow support, you ask people to, you know, contact the creators whenever they have an issue, if they cannot navigate the platform. Um, so the forums are always open and so on. How much people use it, of course, it's not always easy. Yeah? So I'm not saying it's ideal, but I have a feeling that there is a progress uh, there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what yeah. I just wanted to add. Yeah, and one thing that uh, still comes from the courses that we're hosting, uh, when we ask people's uh, education level, we actually notice that usually it's the same level of education that attracts, you know, people. So we actually have usually super educated audience, you know, even in Erasmus Plus MOOC or other other uh, courses online. Usually it's people with bachelor degree, master degree, and that represents the general trend in the online learning. Uh, just this morning, I was reading one research when, when people were researching young learners, they also found that those who are doing good online, these are young people whose parents are quite well educated. So actually, the, the level of education makes, makes an impact on how people are confident in learning online, how confident are they, you know, actually being on their own self-directing themselves or how much they saw examples of others using computer for learning and this is a this is important aspect and then now i start seeing articles how schools moving now online because they, they stopped uh, schools and then many schools moved online without thinking actually how they support people mm. who need more support and and i think here it's something still for us all to see uh, how we can support those who might find it difficult really to uh, learn alone and, and navigate themselves. Um, so it's, uh, I, I pressed partially agree. I think in, in, there are certain things that really become much more inclusive than during the residential activities. But uh, I think there are, there are people who definitely have difficulty just, you know, learning online without uh, live relationship. So it's, there is there are limits to that for sure as for any other type of learning mm -hmm. yes good shall yeah. we uh... yeah i'm thinking uh yeah so then a couple of um um uh, couple of things uh if we look at principles of non-formal learning um uh, we said that uh, uh, one of the principles is uh, active participation of learners, yeah, and then we say the more people contribute to the learning, uh, the more they learn themselves. Yeah, and then I see also certain similarities here, that uh, uh, active participation is especially important for the courses where uh, sometimes the whole content of the course is built on contributions. Yeah, so, for example, there is not enough knowledge, there is not enough expertise. These are so-called connectivist-based learning, when actually the knowledge is built on the learner's contribution. And here, I think active participation is very important. So we saw also today during the uh, survey that quite a number of people want to take more like a learning alone, a more passive role, a more observer role. So... Um, here, I think also we need to see um, how much we can rely on, on, on contributions. Um, but that's also important because what I felt that during online courses, we put generic knowledge, but it's very difficult to have contextualized knowledge because we don't know who are the participants coming. So we don't, we don't know their realities. And that's why in having forums, online spaces, um, where people can contribute with their knowledge and their experiences 
which are very context-based, um, then it gives actually a bigger diversity of a picture, like of the phenomena that is there in the courts, whether it's volunteering or, I don't know, international projects or any other topic. So I think that's, it, it, it matters a lot because actually contributions of people, you know, bring, bring aspects that the course designers or the facilitators cannot bring because they come also from very specific contexts. Yeah. Just to check, any questions, anything to add before we uh, move on? Michelle is typing. Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Michelle is uh, uh, adding a trainer's wisdom if you want, if I suppose you want to learn something new, create a training course about it. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. I don't know, Michelle, if that's how you meant it. And uh, maybe you can clarify. But for me, uh, really just playing around and really, I mean, for example, when we uh, we have Anum here with us and we, when we were doing things for the um, European Solidarity course, MOOC, for example, yeah, uh, there, a, there are things that we know. Um, but there are things that we needed to research a lot and then we did interviews a lot and so on. So there was a lot of research involved, I think, uh, from our side uh, as well. And then participants as well, bringing their uh, perspectives and contributions and, and so on. Yeah. It's maybe maybe one one idea. I, I think when I think back as uh, when I started as a trainer, um, I was trying to be on the safe side. So um, the methods I felt comfortable with or some knowledge I felt comfortable with and um, and only when I got the, a bit more reassured, um, I trusted a little bit more the process and let go and uh, concentrated more on learner's needs. And I think if you go online, you have the same process. Yeah, so my advice would be don't pack there, I don't know, too much knowledge. Um, start with a little bit less um, and create really a learning experience yeah but don't create i don't know just a kind of knowledge based course because i don't think this is this is in our intention of non formal education but you have to realize it it's maybe a matter of um, being in the comfort zone because okay knowledge is something we can handle but the platform can handle it and the, yeah um but uh, yeah, be open and risk something. Yeah, less content. Yeah, try to make it co-created a little bit, like uh, or in a connected way. Try to involve them. Yeah, and um, yeah, and open yourself also for this process. Mm -hmm. You have some uh, supporters there, Michelle, for this agreement, and uh, yeah. Uh, which actually really flows in into our next kind of principle that we wanted to use, potentially the one that we should have started with, but not necessarily. It's about experiential learning because people are often asking, but how do we do experiential learning online? So we have actually uh, a question. Uh, we don't go to the gem boards. Uh, it's just there and open. It's what kind of experiences can we offer as part of the experiential learning online? Yeah. Uh, we have some thoughts on this, of course, but um, if you have any ideas and you would like to share some of your things, it's... Um, it's time to take the mic, yeah? So what kind of experiences can we offer? Is this the moment when you take the observer role and uh, listening to the others or? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, okay, okay. <laughs> Marcus is thinking in an observing way. <laughs> Very good. So then maybe we share some of the things and then you... Uh... Oh, wait, um, we have a contribution. So Michel is very excited to be in the role of... Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of... Uh, I like, like changing. Um, <laughs> one course, which is about uh, solidarity projects, which is a kind of a little bit of a variation of the old youth initiatives in the program European Solidarity Corps. And we have a short course which um, helps the people to get closer to the application form. And we have one part which is um, about the kind of, let's say, the, the kind of the needs analysis of the target group, the local, um, the local environment, the organization. And based, basically, it's uh, it's 
it's not very much content. It's just a way of how to do it. And the experience is go, go into the field and do it. Yeah, we have um, short uh, interview guidelines and we ask the people to, to do interviews with five, six people around. So what are the needs in your local environment under the young people? and come back with the results. So I think that's the, that's the learning experience. It's very in, introducing very, very little c content. It's, it's just kind of a, yeah, it's a one page, uh, A4 basically, and then go out into the field and uh, see with what things are they coming back and trying to put it then into the, the creating of the concept of the solidarity project. So that's, that, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. And Joanna also well, added it. Yeah, say like minutes. You know, I just wanted to ask other people maybe to tell if they already gave some practical experiential tasks for people in, online. Mm -hmm. I think we have Mark. Well, I don't. Yeah, yeah Marcus. I, I was just thinking experiential learning cycle. So, so if the, what part can be done online? So, so I guess there's three possibilities. No, Michelle mentioned one already. That you use online tools to reflect on the experience that already took place mm -hmm. so people have had experiences before as Laimuna said this depends on the context of the learners then or that you give a task like Michael said you give people a task and then do the the reflection on it online or you create experience as such online mm. but with this yeah we don't have we had we gave some group tasks of course or we gave a task yes to meet with the with the team in their organizations make organizational self-assessment and brought things back to the to the course but to go strongly into creating an experience online we don't have yeah we don't have this experience yet mm -mm -mm. and sorry it might be a very obvious question and i can imagine maybe it will actually come from you my curiosity because I was also thinking more or less as what uh, Michel and Marcus was saying. Uh, then of course my question is when we are talking about the MOOC where there are <clears throat> sorry, uh, many people and all these aspects are a bit, uh, I mean there are several <laughs> relevant for different people then uh, how, how, would, uh, how would it work to design it uh, that it, won't, it will be relevant for all the participants? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an obvious question, as I <laughs> told you, but uh, I'm thinking about it now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe Snake can uh, uh, pick a few points that we were talking before, you know, and mm -hmm. what experiences we can suggest and how we mm -hmm. can have that cycle of experience and reflection and, and coming with conclusions yeah we can then maybe you can pick up with the MOOC also after and uh, uh, so in terms of the, I think the things that we mentioned it's also something that uh, yeah Lyman and I actually have notes we have pages of notes so this is what we are referring to but um, it's something that I also put in my notes when I was thinking about this it's these um, especially if you have uh, blended courses that have more than one residential phase yeah as I was mentioning a couple of days ago yeah and one of the ones that I really use very often is this thing of people, you know, recording videos, interviewing people in their local community, their colleagues or young people and so on, and then really bringing this either online or to the residential. I think that's a classic and it works very well. And I think this is where online learning excels. Yeah, because you don't, you know, if you do give a task during the residential, we often people send in the local community, so send people in the local community that is unknown to them so the effects of this are not so strong yeah so this really allows for people to take their time make the videos and so on and then talk about this um and i think this is uh this is quite good another thing that we did for example is that uh uh, if for those who were there two days ago when I talked about that we put a session on change uh, in Yoko Moodle because we didn't manage to do um, uh, it during the, the residential. But actually what we did is we started some things during the residential. We asked people to to kind of practice the change, to do things in their environment. So experience was also created somehow in their daily life. And then we did the conceptual concept actualization or generalization basically online yeah and then we had a session where we gained the insights and so on so i think different ways as marcus was also pointing some of them are possible combining the online and offline 
Um, I think it's also possible to create experiences online. Uh, what I experienced was uh, mostly through video conferencing. Yeah, uh, we even tried at some point when I was running dialogue. So this is not connected to Moodle, but when I was running dialogue session, we did, for example, Abigail online. Yeah, it's a classic. But uh, so it's actually possible to do some of them. And now for the MOOC, we will try to experiment with um, with the uh, voice uh, voice guided fantasy yeah, and see how it goes. Not very deep one, so I think that's also a concern. So I think. Uh, with this, I think, as you were saying, Marcus, to really have an online online experience and not something that you give online and then people do it in their local community. I think that's still maybe at the beginning, but I think there are possibilities and we are trying it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's about the group. Michelle is making a point about the group, but that's the last point that we have for this. So we'll come back to it uh, uh, later. Yeah, and then also gamification is uh, gamif gamification is uh, Marcus is saying. But Lyman, do you want to add something also to them? to this point of um, experience? I think it also depends uh, how we see experiential learning. For me, watching a video and then mm. having opportunity to reflect on what did I understand of this? What I, do I take for myself? Uh, that's already a first step. Yeah, and then in the online learning environment, it's important and I think to accept that this is also an important experience. People watched few videos, they watch few examples so that we design spaces where people can uh, share their reflection. Sometimes it stays individual and that's totally fine. But then I think where it's maybe more challenging online is to have shared reflection and discussion of sometimes confronting each other. And then sometimes it requires more uh, synchronous moments or kind of live webinars for people to discuss. Uh, but sometimes it's asynchronous, so I just share my feeling or my reflection and then you know I move on and other people will add theirs so there maybe sharing reflection is not always a big discussion but also that's something we say in, in residential uh, uh, learning right sometimes we say share reflection it's not necessary to confront someone's reflection in a way and then I think once we design the course it's also important that it's not only watching something reflecting and that's it but then there's also practical tasks that people make some kind of conclusions and they try to apply what they learn. So for example, I have a policy and then we had a number of sessions. And at the end, for example, after learning about strategies of online learning, they have to make a small assignment to, to design uh, a mini strategy. So people really see how does it feel of doing it and then they share with others and then others can review as well and give comments to each other. So then actually participants get also into the role of seeing what others did, how did they apply their knowledge into the practical task. And the um, online environments allow doing these things. And people also are quite, quite happy, you know, if somebody reacts on the work they did. So because they're often not sure, you know, when learning online, you lack often immediate feedback. So that's, I think it still can happen with the, with the technology available. And some of the experiences not always going doing something live, but it's also experience of dealing with the content online. Mm. Yeah. And I think just one more thing to add, uh, which I was thinking about yesterday, online still for many people, online learning is an experience in its own, Yeah, the whole online experience. So if you have a blended learning course, even if with a MOOC, I think you can do it through surveys, just to try to process people's experience. Yeah. So how was it to actually learn it? this for many people still new environment? Yeah. I mean, we are the, the two of us who've been doing online learning for years. We are still clicking around with this click meeting. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's, it's really cool to use this. You know, if we talk about the classic uh, challenge and stretch zone and so on, to really try to process uh, how is it for people and what they learn from this in the new environment. Mm. Yeah? I see people are also replying to each other on the on the chat. So with the groups, I see that there is a lot of discussion around the groups. So that's the last point that we wanted to tackle in this session. Uh, but you will see us again after the at the break. And it's also about the importance of group and group building online. Yeah. Uh, we thought that this is something that is often highlighted as one of the either principles or something that characterizes uh, non-formal education learning, which is this, you know, using group as a source of uh, learning. So we were curious to, to see um, also how that works online. So we have um, one more uh, survey for you, which is how important is to have a sense of the group in an online course? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. OK. 
Okay. Voting results coming in. I think my feedback to the click meeting would be that there should be a possibility for people to see, see the results and not just the presenters. Because now I can see. Okay. Maybe you know there are results that you don't want to show and you say, oh, oh so, no, but there could be an option, no? I think they should have an option. Uh, yeah, maybe there's some. It's like, how did you like this uh, session? Okay, no, I don't. Uh... Okay, I think I, I, I end and I share. So this is what we have. Uh, quite important. Uh, I think here we have the slight majority, very important and not so important. Uh, would someone like to comment on this? Just uh, maybe a couple of brief comments if someone would like to say why they feel this way. Yeah, I very important. And I just want to underline that sense of group not always mean interaction. Mm -hmm. Some people do not like to be forced to interact. Uh, but enjoy very much seeing that there, there are other people who read about their experiences, etc. Even if you learn just with video tutorials, it's very nice to see the comments below. You don't interact, but yeah. you see what other people thought, etc. So mm -hmm. Just this point, group feeling does not always mean necessarily interaction. And in that sense, I think group feeling is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Marcus. Michel? Mm -hmm. um, it's also the, it, it depends what kind of course. I mean, I enrolled in a lot of courses on Coursera and uh, Udemy and Skillshare, just because I needed the knowledge. I needed the knowledge, uh, and I was going there. I was not interested in, in in interaction. I wanted to have the knowledge to do some online marketing, or I needed the knowledge to set up uh, my LinkedIn profile or to get some project management um, ideas how to monitor my project better so this is one side at the same time if i think about our field uh, and we should make a difference there that we make different different courses and for us i think groups are very important yeah it's it's, it's not only an individual learning but there should be also the option to have some uh, some social learning Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see Ada also raising the hand. But we have Christine, Christine I think. Okay. Ready to yeah, Christine and Ada. We can hear you! Yay! Finally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but more or less it was the same that Michael already said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, sad. But I think it's like one of the advantages for online of online courses is actually that you could be kind of invisible, but still be part of the group and still yeah. learn something, and you don't have to be forced into a community. So I think some people feel comfortable with it. Maybe yeah. also as a first step, you know, to start to okay, starting to be a bit interactive. So um, I really think it's it's one of the advantages that you could be there as an individual and don't be forced into the to this community building mm -hmm. but then again of course for our courses and what we are aiming for i think the community part is quite important and essential for what we want to achieve with our courses usually so mm -hmm. thank you thanks edda hi <laughs> uh edda um i chose not so important because i read the question as a learner for me what is important and i realized i replied like this and then i read the question uh, thought the question again and i realized as a person who is offering the course i would have replied completely differently then it made me think a little bit then uh, when i'm uh, creating a course then may i don't take myself as a learner maybe <laughs> as a as criteria or it could be because uh, these are different targets but uh, i found it then quite interesting this my inner maybe it's not a conflict but <laughs> this uh, different way of seeing when uh, i look at this question from the per point of view of uh, the learner or a person who is facilitating a course or organizing it hmm. But I think that's a very good point, yeah? How much do we value group and how much do we want to interact with the group and how much do we want people that we are facilitating yeah. to be in the group? I, 
I mean, it means that uh, if I'm organizing and I have this reflection right now, then I have to really have a good idea if there are people like me in that group who would like to do it more maybe on their own own <laughs> and not yeah. much uh, interaction. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ada. Dagna also has a thumb up. I don't know, Dagna, is it for now or from before? It's a thumb up. She agrees. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, she agrees. Cool. Okay, uh, thank you for um, for these. Um, I think in terms of the group, I think actually, it's, it. I think we we made the right choice to have these surveys and and ask you first because I think a lot of uh, things were said that we anyways uh, thought to cover, and I think one of the what Marco said first, the sense of the group. I think it's a very important thing to highlight. Yeah, uh, because uh, uh, the close. Um, because I think it also changes a little bit how we see the group, you know, do we need this uh, group tasks and group to be built and so on and everyone working together or is it enough or enough or sometimes it's even more difficult to create a sense of community that people know that the group is there, that people know that the process is taken care of, that there are experiences to be shared and so on and that uh, and that's there and I think that's really important to highlight. I think, and this is the uh, discussion, I think this was going between uh, Michelle and Sami, it's about group tasks in blended learning, or actually it's not so much about blended, but it's smaller courses. I think definitely there are group tasks and in Moodle, you can put people into groups or they can choose groups yeah, and then have tasks to do. Yeah? So I think that's possible. And definitely what I saw when comparing blended and, and MOOC uh, is that a group as we know it in the residential setting, it's more important in the, in the smaller courses, yeah, that there is a group that people interact, that they know each other, that they share different tasks uh, and so on. Um, and then there are, as I said, different options. Yeah, in Moodle, you can have small groupings or give them the tasks to, I think what also enhances the sense of the group is, uh, is when people are asked to bring something from their reality. Yeah? So it's not just, this is my name and this is what I do, but they bring a little bit of their perspective as well. Yeah? But just a, a little, one more thing before I pass it to, to Limanus, I think uh, what online learning gives, and I think this is something that we are becoming more and more aware uh, in the non-formal education as such, is that there is a space for individuals as well. Yeah? And I think this online learning actually provides more than what we do in face-to-face, -face, yeah? So if you don't want to interact, if you just want to benefit from the sense of the group and the community, but still go on with whatever, you know, knowledge that you need to gain or um, um, whatever videos that you want to watch or interaction, I think that's fine. And, and this is something that I'm trying to value uh, more and more in the, in the online learning, yeah? So group, yes, but maybe more like the group is there and then I can choose what I do with this uh, sense of the group. I think that's quite important. Right, yeah, I felt uh, it's quite still important to give space for people to really to introduce themselves and that's, that's something we can do in an online learning environment and people write either very little or a lot. Uh, in one course, I think I put criteria that you should introduce yourself, but you will see others only if you do it yourself. So a bit of, you know, you give and get type of principle because people usually are curious to know others but not always are eager to say who they are so in this case for building a sense of group and seeing the diversity sometimes i put that kind of requirement you know you should post yourself first and then see others and usually it gives for me as a facilitator it gives the feeling of wow how global the group is in some cases when it go, gets to the MOOCs um, and then it, it really depends uh, how people how much people need the group for learning okay. um, in some cases people really appreciate if they can get feedback from others so this is also about organizing people into groups giving assignments either to work together or uh, get feedback from others i think maybe in smaller groups it's easier to manage but in big groups um, it's more challenging because you know usually uh, um, it's out of all people who enrolled around 15% taking active part and out of these 15% some of them they still choose to be more learning alone and and as observers so you know it's a tricky thing with the numbers how big the groups you make and how not to make group too small because if you want to have discussion in the group you still need few people being active so mm -hmm. I think we had some we had some challenges with that when it comes to really having few thousand people in the course that's really a massive uh, uh, course, huh? and then yeah. cool. Um, 
Yeah, so I think Sami is agreeing and saying that what makes it's what makes the feeling that there is a group and there are uh, people from different sides of the um, of the of the world. It's still good to know others before starting. I agree. I think it's uh, this is why in MOOC also and and the alignment is I think in also in your other MOOCs there is always something that allows people to to introduce themselves if they would want to, and it does it does uh, bring this sense. Yeah. yeah.